Hi, I'm Ted Morrissey, and this is the uh, novella and long story class for uh, Linda Woods MFA. I um, want to talk about uh, our first uh, piece of writing that we looked at in depth, and that's uh, Leo Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Illich, of course. Uh, before we get to that, though, I have gotten hold of, uh, of writing the novella by Sharon Ord Warner, and I've been pouring through it. And I'll be uh, probably referring to this, that, and the other uh, during various videos. Uh, one of the things that um, she talks about is that uh, our definition of what a novella is versus a long story versus a novel, et cetera, um, has changed over time. Uh, so that's obviously added to some of the uh, confusion um, because, you know, what I may have thought of as a uh, a long story uh, at one point now is maybe more considered a novella and case in point is in fact um, the death of Ivan Illich. I don't remember when I first read that uh, story, um, maybe high school, maybe undergrad uh, years and college, but it's been a long time in any event. And um, I know therefore most of my life i've thought of it as a as a short story a long short story but a short story nevertheless but now it certainly is more in the realm of what we would tend to think of as a novella so part of the I don't know, difficulty if you will of using simply word counts or some kind of measuring stick like that to determine whether something's a story versus a novella versus a novel is that that sense of, of, of the number has changed over the decades. And so um, that's another reason why having discussions about are there other factors besides length that I think is worth having. But we do want to talk to you about uh, the death of Ivan Illich just uh, briefly. I've already posted some notes, um, some written notes on the story or uh, related to the story. But uh, I want to uh, turn to this book for some discussion of Ivan Illich. This is uh, Vladimir Nabokov's Lectures on Russian Literature. Uh, hopefully you know uh, Nabokov from his own writing as, as a novelist and a story writer, uh, probably most well known, of course, for the, the book Lolita, uh, but he wrote lots of books before that and after and after that. But he also was a, uh, a very well-respected uh, college professor, uh, largely at uh, Cornell University. He taught a few other places here and there, but that's uh, mainly what we associate him with is about a decade or so of teaching at Cornell. So eventually um, his lecture notes were taken and published. This specifically is on Russian authors. As you can see there, Chekhov, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Turgenev, Gorky, and Gogol. There is another volume devoted to American authors. I haven't got that one. I, I plan to get that one because uh, this is very good, and I'm sure that is very good as well. So I want to read a bit from what he has to say about the death of Ivan Illich and just kind of maybe expand on that a little bit uh, impromptu as I go through that. Uh, really, most of his... Um, uh, discussion of Tolstoy is focused on uh, Anna Karenin. Um, he says, by the way, that uh, the original translators of that novel got the name wrong. There should be no A on the end of Karenin. And I, I, I think Vladimir Nabokov would, would know better than most if that's true. So he always refers to it as Anna Karenin. And you may have noticed in my, uh, in my writing on the discussion board, I left the A off usually um, just because I'm trying to, trying to honor what Nabokov uh, tried to teach me. But um, there's a long section on um, Anna Karenin, uh, on its structure and, and uh, its you know, symbolism and characterization and on and on and on. So if you're interested in that novel in particular, and particularly maybe if you teach Anna Karenin, Karenina, um, you definitely would want to get a hold of Nabokov's notes on that novel in particular. His uh, notes on the death of Ivan Illich um, is much shorter um, than that, uh, but he does say some really interesting, insightful things about this long story slash novella. So I just want to share a few of his insights and, like I said, maybe expand on them just a little bit myself. Um, he says um, that, uh, let, me, let me start here. It's hard to know where to begin exactly, but let me start with this sentence. 
He says, Tolstoy surely realized that in him, as in many writers, there did go on the personal struggle between creative solitude and the urge to associate with all mankind, the battle between the book and the band. In Tolstoyan terms, in the symbols of Tolstoyan later philosophy, as after he finished Anna Karenin, creative solitude became synonymous with sin. It was egoism. It was the pampering of one's self and therefore a sin. Conversely, the idea of all mankind, italicized all mankind, was in Tolstoyan terms, the idea of God. God is in men and God is universal love. And Tolstoy advocated the loss of one's personality in this universal God love. He suggested, in other words, that in the personal struggle between the godless artist and the godly man, the latter should better win if the synthetic man wishes to be happy. All right, but that's an interesting thought that in all writers, there's this sort of dual pull. On the one hand, writers need solitude in order to create, um, but yet at the same time, they need human fellowship uh, in order to um, fulfill, you know, other other parts of their spirit or, or whatever it might be, right? And I think um, anyone who, you know, has, you know, family, uh, you know, close friends, what have you, that is a writer or maybe any kind of artist um, has has felt the, the strain of that pull, right? Um, you want to be alone for you know, significant chunks of time in order to do your art, to write, to paint, to compose your music, whatever it might be. But yet you're also being pulled into the family dynamic, into, you know, social, social events, you know, uh, going out to dinner or whatever it might be. Right. And so you've got this sort of dual, uh, you know, urge, uh, the, these, these pressures kind of pulling you in both directions. And obviously one has to win out over the other. Hopefully one can kind of find a balance between the two. Um, but uh, I think I think it's a really insightful uh, comment that Tolstoy definitely felt that. Now, he took it further in, in applying, you know, one of those urges to being self-centeredness and the other, you know, the, the artistic urge being self-centeredness and the urge to be with other people as being more godly um, and that kind of thing. I don't know that um, that's necessarily how most writers, most artists think of it, but that's how Tolstoy eventually came to think of it. Uh, Nabokov goes on. We must retain a lucid vision of these spiritual facts in order to appreciate the philosophy of the story, the death of Ivan Illich. Ivan is, of course, the Russian for John, and John in Hebrew means God is good, God is gracious. I know it's not easy for non-Russian speaking people to pronounce the patronymic Illich, which of course means the son of Ilya, the Russian version of the name Elias or Elijah, which incidentally means in Hebrew, Jehovah is God. Ilya is a very common Russian name pronounced very much like the French Ilya. I'm saying that the same way both ways. And Illich is pronounced Illich, the ills and itches of mortal life. Now comes my first point, says Nabokov. This is really the story not of Ivan's death, but the story of Ivan's life. The physical death described in the story is part of mortal life. It is merely the last phase of mortality. According to Tolstoy, mortal man, personal man, individual man, physical man, goes his physical way to nature's garbage can. According to Tolstoy, spiritual man returns to the cloudless region of universal God love. That's God hyphen love. An abode of neutral bliss so dear to oriental mystics. The Tolstoyan formula is... Colon. Ivan lived a bad life, and since a bad life is nothing but the death of the soul, then Ivan lived a living death. And since beyond death is God's living light, then Ivan died into new life, life with a capital L. So uh, this idea of spirituality, um, if Ivan is essentially um, godly at the end of the story, then he is being prepared held into a sort of spiritual life. And in retrospect, his life had been dead up until that point anyway, based on the decisions that he made and the relationships he had with his family, his wife, his children, and so on. My second point 
is that this story was written in March 1886 at a time when Tolstoy was nearly 60 and had firmly established the Tolstoyan fact that writing masterpieces of fiction was a sin. He had firmly made up his mind that if he would write anything after the great sins of his middle years, War and Peace and Anna Karen, Karenin, it would be only in the way of simple tales for the people, for peasants, for school children, pious educational fables, moralistic fairy tales, that kind of thing. Here and there in the death of Ivan Illich, there is a half-hearted attempt to proceed with this trend, and we shall find samples of a pseudo-fable style here and there in the story. But on the whole, it is the artist who takes over. This story is Tolstoy's most artistic, most perfect, and most sophisticated achievement. Thanks to the fact that Guarney has so admirably translated the thing, I shall have the opportunity at last to discuss Tolstoy's style. Tolstoy's style is a marvelously complicated, ponderous instrument. All right, so a um, couple of things I want to kind of underscore there. One is just the sort of interesting fact about Tolstoy that after completing War and Peace and Anna Karenin, that he wanted to write differently. He wanted to write simple moral tales to try to teach people important moral lessons. Um, and uh, Nabokov says that at times you can see that reflected in the death of Ivan Illich, but in the process, the artist Tolstoy just couldn't help himself, and those artistic elements come out again and again in the story. So in spite of one to write, in spite of wanting to write a simple story, he just couldn't do it. And uh, those of you who've had me in other classes may know that this is something I've talked about before, written about before, this idea that um, there are some writers who can write, you know, very sort of simple, plot-driven, page-turning kinds of stories, um, you know, in novels and so on, and they can be widely published and, and widely read, and, and that's great. But for other writers, it's very hard to write that way. Even if you try to write something simple, um, you just your brain just doesn't let you, and you just sort of start spinning into these you know more complex kinds of ideas, kind of narrative structures, and so forth. And so it's harder to write simply than what one might think it would be, especially if one isn't a writer and trying to write narratives and, and so forth. Um, so he tries to write that way, he tries to write simply, and it just doesn't quite work. There's a, there's a great Henry James story, uh, the title of which is not coming to me, but it's about a writer who wants to write a simple, straightforward story, and yet everything he writes becomes like this artistic masterpiece. He just can't help himself. So he's like doomed to write nothing but these these masterpieces that that uh, are maybe uh, you know admired but hardly read, right? And so Tolstoy maybe was grappling with the same sort of phenomenon. <clears throat> um, then this is a a really uh, uh, important point too, I think, that I want to touch on. Hang on a second. I'm going to pause this. Okay, a little tickle there. Didn't want you to have to experience that. So um, this next paragraph. He says, you may have seen, you must have seen some of those awful textbooks written by, not by educators, but by educationalists, by people who talk about books instead of talking within books. You may have been told by them that the chief aim of a great writer, and indeed the main clue to his greatness, is quote unquote simplicity. Traitors, not teachers. In reading exam papers written by misled students of both sexes about this or that author, I have often come across such phrases, probably recollections from more tender years of schooling, as, quote, his style is simple, or his style is clear and simple, or his style is beautiful and simple, or his style is quite beautiful and simple. But remember that simplicity is bon calme, is nonsense. No major writer is simple. The Saturday Evening Post is simple. Journalese is simple. Upton Lewis is simple. Mom is simple. Digests are simple. Damnation is simple. But Tolstoy's and Melville's are not simple. And I really, really like that, um, is that um, 
you know, this idea that, um, you know, striving for simplicity in one's writing is not striving to write great stuff, that, you know, great writing is complex, um, either because of the ideas, because of the structure, because of the language being used, or maybe all of those things, right? Um, earlier in, in his uh, lectures on uh, Tolstoy in general and, and Anna Karenin, he talks about um, how in order to write those books, Tolstoy had to break molds. He had to write differently, especially War and Peace, um, and that uh, that you know incurred the criticism of a lot of, of a lot of readers, you know, negative criticism, and um, because they just didn't get it, they didn't understand what he was trying to do, and uh, so he you know he didn't have a, a solid plan of what he was trying to do when he started out, um, and he wasn't necessarily trying to. Uh, write these sort of hybrid types of, of works. Uh, but in order to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish, he ended up doing that. And at first it wasn't understood. And, and like I said, it got a lot of criticism, but obviously he, he knew what he was doing artistically and, and, and won the day. Um, yeah, one more, one more point here I want to uh, focus on. A conspicuous feature of the structure is that Ivan is dead when the story starts. However, there is little contrast between the dead body and the existence of the people who discuss his death and view his body, since from Tolstoy's point of view, their existence is not life but a living death. We discover at the very beginning one of the many thematic lines of the story, the pattern of trivialities, the automatic mechanism, the unfeeling vulgarity of the bureaucratic middle-class city life in which so recently Ivan himself had participated. Ivan's civil service colleagues think of how his death will affect their careers. So in receiving the news of Ivan Illich's death, the first thought of each of the gentlemen in those chambers what of the changes was of the changes and promotions it might occasion among themselves or their acquaintances. I'll be sure to get Stable's place in Vinikov's or Vinikov's thought Fyodor uh, Velovich. Uh, I was promised that long ago, and the promotion means an extra eight rubles, eight hundred rubles a year for me, besides the allowance, etc. So in there, immediately. Um, thinking about how they will benefit from uh, Ivan's death, they are demonstrating their own death in life situation. That if that's all you're interested in is just getting you know, material wealth, um, you know, bureaucratic promotion, et cetera, you're not living anyway. So you may as well be dead is, is sort of the point that Tolstoy seems to be making. According to Nabokov, it makes sense to me. Um, so uh, I'll just kind of leave you with that. I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about any of uh, Nabokov's thoughts on Ivan Illich or just writing in general, uh, maybe particularly things about, uh, you know, greater writers are not simple um, and things like that. Uh, also, you know, whether there is a certain talent to writing simply and straightforwardly or whether, um, you know, uh, that is... Uh, you know, a skill that um, some people strive for and just aren't able to achieve no matter how hard they try. You know, anything like that is fine or anything else related to the topic, but I would like you to weigh in with some kind of comments. All right. I will see you down the digital trail.